And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Jim Gates, Jr. Jim is widely renowned for his, uh, renowned for his work on supersymmetry, supergravity, and super string theory. In general, he's a super guy. He's the director of the Brown Theoretical Physics Center and the Ford Foundation Professor of Physics at Brown University, as well as an affiliate mathematics professor and a faculty fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies and Public Affairs. Professor Gates received two BS degrees and a PhD from MIT, where his doctoral thesis was the institution's first on the topic of supersymmetry. In 1984, he co-authored Superspace, the first comprehensive book on supersymmetry. As the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at, Harvard, uh, at Howard University, he served as the founding director of the NASA-funded Center for the Study of Terrestrial and Extraterrestrial Atmospheres. Among his many professional affiliations, Professor Gates is a fellow of the American Physical Society, where he currently serves as president-elect. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2013, becoming the first African-American theoretical physicist so recognized in the 150-year history of the Academy. We, he also served with me on the, president, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. That's where I got to know Jim. And uh, we became great friends through that experience and, and saw some just amazing things uh, that affected our, our country in, I think, very significant ways. Um, he served in the Maryland State Board of Education and the National Commission on Forensic Science. In 2013, in a ceremony at the White House, President Obama awarded him the National Medal of Science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gates. Hello, Chad. Uh, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Uh, we can. I can hear you, yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation, as well as Margaret Connolly and Mark Hyden, your colleagues who have made this process possible. Um, as I was telling some of you before the, uh, we started streaming, I was really frightened when, Mar when Chad reached out to me and said, why don't you come speak to us? And I thought, you know, I'm an old guy with a single active brain cell. I only worry about plus and minus signs, and I'm supposed to talk to people who are remaking the world through nanotechnology? How does that work? And Chad said, well, it's a friendly crowd, so why don't you come and do this? And you know, so my talk is not gonna be about nano, but nano to the fourth power. So where I do my science is actually four times smaller uh, than where nano exists. It's really around 10 to the minus 35, 36. And the only tools that we have to do that kind of science is mathematics. So I often tell people I am a fallen mathematician. Um, uh, Chad mentioned that my undergraduate degrees are both in math and physics. So I've always wanted to exist on the boundary of the fields. So let's get started. I'm gonna share screen and start my presentation. So here we go. Um, so in this uh, nano to the fourth regime, there are problems that uh, we encounter that sometimes takes decades to solve. And today I'm gonna to talk about how by not thinking like a physicist, I was able to solve a problem. And this touches on some of the things that are relevant to, to nanoscience. Uh, for example, the kind of uh, things that, uh, that come out of uh, res uh, research in nanoscience will obviously lead to more powerful computers and that really will enable what I do. And I, we're gonna talk touch on that shortly. Let me just start here. This is what I looked like when I met Chad. Notice the long black hair. Well, you saw me in the introduction, it's white now. Part of the blame for that I put on Chad. So we're gonna go from chemistry to the standard model and spin. So this was Mendeleev's table of elements when he first invented it. Notice the holes. Well, that's because those elements had not been discovered in nature. Today, of course, the table of elements looks like this. And this is part of the enabling foundation for nanoscience, knowing what the chemical elements are. If we go to my part of physics, we study particle physics. And here we're at about nano square as opposed to nano four to the fourth. And we still have technologies that allow us to probe this regime. The Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, which discovered the Higgs boson, which I just popped out for you, that works in that regime. But one thing about chemistry that's very interesting is that all these tiny particles spin, and in particular, electrons have spin. They have a rate of spin that we just typically denote by S, and the square of this is, is actually parameterized by an integer J times the square of Planck's constant. So these small objects all have spin, except for one exception that we'll get to. Now this property of spin is the basis of chemistry. 
And so if we use this to separate the elementary particles, we can see the columns that I have, have on this transparency. Well, that's because all the things in the left-hand column have the same spin rate. They're all the spin rate of the electron. And you can see the ball with a little E in it. That represents the electron. But nature copies the electron at least three times. So there's a mu particle and a tau particle, which you'll also see in that same region. These particles are subject to the fundamental forces in nature. They don't carry the four fundamental forces. But the carriers of the fundamental forces have different rates of spin. And you see them in the right-hand column. So we've separated uh, the elementary particles into whether the forces act upon them or whether the, they carry the forces and with respect to the rates of spin, either an, in, either a, an integer, a whole integer, or a half integer times a, an odd uh, integer, one half times an odd integer. So this is what our world looks like. Okay, so why do people like me con uh, concern ourselves with this? Well, because although it may seem like we're mathematicians, we're not. We're really interested in the nature of, of reality. And if you're going to talk about reality, you have to consult reality. So we have to be concerned with experiment. But in my field, we're on the boundary of the two. We have to do both ex get experiments, make predictions that are verified, as well as have mathematical equations which agree with those. Um, the person who really got this all started is Albert Einstein. So let's talk about him a little bit. Um, so in 1905, he invented the theory of special relativity. It's about matrices and it says space time is kind of a grid and you can act with these matrices. On those grid points, you can see the coordinates X, Y, and Z on my slide and T is for time. Uh, the rates at which they're measured for someone moving is different than the rates they're measured when they're at rest. And that's what you see the matrix equation at the top. We can visualize this by saying that space time is a grid and this grid is flexible. And so the distance in this animation, we measure horizontally. As you can see, as I uh, cause the grid to deform, the distance uh, shrinks. Whereas the up and down distance represent time. And in fact, this says that simultaneity doesn't exist in relativity. So this comes from Albert Einstein. In 19, uh, 1915, he gave us some more mathematics, which winds up explaining why gravity works. And we see in this animation, the sun with a dimple around it, the Earth is curving around that dimple and has its own dimple, which keeps the moon in orbit. This comes from Einstein's 1915 work. Now, although people don't really uh, give Einstein a lot of credit, he actually is partly responsible for quantum theory, something that's very, very important in the realm of nanoscience, where we can no longer rely on the physics of Newton to describe the, uh, the particles and the the composites and what have you, and the rules by which they move, we have to use quantum theory. And so nanoscience also has relevance for us increasing our understanding of what's going on at the quantum level. At quantum, we're about 10 to the minus 18. So we're about, quant we're about uh, nano square. So uh, this is a picture of how forces work at that level. In this picture, we see two white dots. Those represent electrons. You see the wavy line in the middle. That represents a photon, the carrier of the electromagnetic repulsion. Let's set this cartoon in motion. We can see now from this cartoon why two electrons are repelled. Because they exchange a photon. The photon tails one electron, then another goes close by. Like particles repel, and therefore, that's what you get. This is called a Feynman diagram after Richard, uh, Richard Feynman. However, that's equivalent to just throwing a ball and watching it uh, as you throw a ball from there, watch that, 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 uh, that curving path that it travels, which we physicists call the classical path. But if you're in a quantum universe, gee, that ball might travel in a very stochastic and, and jiggly path. And so Einstein's contribution also had implications for quantum mechanics. Remember that force law that I just showed you? Well, that's a classical force law. What's a force law look like if you take quantum mechanics into effect? Well, you see the same pass with the electrons, the two little lights at the bottom. But in this one, we're going to start it up. And we're going to see that the one electron exchanges a photon with itself. And then a second electron is the carrier that you should be repulsed. Or perhaps this process goes on. This is the first one we saw was what we call vertex normalization. This is what we call vacuum polarization. You can see one electron comes along, it, it sends out a photon, which disassociates into particle and antiparticle. They recombine, reconstruct a second photon, and that tells the electron, the second electron to be repelled. Now, these Feynman diagrams are actually mathematical entities. And for each one of them, you can calculate a numerical value. 
and this is how we use these values. It turns out the electron has a little magnetic property. We call it its G value. If you measure G, you can see it is 2.002324303.9. Uh, the theoretical uh, determination, which is taken by calculating hundreds and hundreds of the kinds of diagrams I just showed you, is 2.002324304. And you can see that we only disagree to one part in a billion at the nanoscale. And this is where nanoscience is gonna become important for me because the kinds of processes and the kinds of materials that are being fabricated in nanoscience will allow us to improve these measurements of the electron uh, magnetic property. Well, what about gravity? Because Einstein did that too. Well, for gravity, uh, I kind of entered the story. This is a picture of me in 1979. I'm at a, my first physics conference at, at Stony Brook, Long Island. Uh, the inventor of a theory called supergravity is in this picture, a gentleman by the name of uh, Peter van Leeuwenhuizen. And we start, uh, this is when my generation tried to, tried to do something beyond Einstein. Uh, this is a, a year later in uh, Cambridge, England. England. Uh, the guy sitting down in front in the wheelchair is probably recognizable to you. His name is Stephen Hawking. And Hawking and I encountered each other a number of times. This is the first time I met him because he was interested in something called supergravity, which is where we're going next. So when Stephen died, uh, I was asked to comment about Stephen. And I hope the audio here works so that people can hear this. Explain one of Hawking's theories in under a minute. Uh, Stephen was one of the people who was sort of like Moses in the sense that a result he found, which was that black holes are not completely black. They actually have a kind of sizzle about them. This is called Bekenstein-Hawking radiation now. And in his research, he's the person who explained how this could happen. And it turned out that if you use Einstein's equations in quantum mechanics, they don't agree with what Stephen's intuition was. That set the foundation to create string theory. And so that's really one of the drivers of this thing that many people have heard called string theory. Einstein's theory and our current formulation of quantum mechanics do not combine to make predictions. And yet quantum mechanics seems to work in the world very small. So we ought to be able to combine them. And until Stephen made his observation along with Jacob Bekenstein, physicists ignored this. We just said, oh, it doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about it. So let's not worry about it. And we didn't. So if you're gonna to try to get a theory that combines them, you have to go beyond what we have. And this leads us to back to our table of particles. You'll notice there's a very asymmetrical left to right. I bet this table looks a lot more symmetrical to you. Now, the way we achieve this is actually by going back and remembering what happened with Mendeleev's table of elements. Namely, there were elements that when Mendeleev first wrote the table, we did not know. So what we are, currently thinking in my part of physics is there are probably a lot more particles that we don't know about. And if they fill out this pattern, which has left-right super symmetry, which we actually call super symmetry, then uh, we can see that we will have a highly, much more highly symmetrical description. So isn't Susie dead? Well, not quite. Some of you who may hear, read the popular literature may hear things like, oh, super symmetry has been disproved. Well, that's not true. All that's happened is that the people uh, who, uh, who were advocates of that model, advocated and allowed us to reach uh, the peak of inflated expectations. And when that didn't occur, we are now at the trough of disillusionment, but the community is still moving towards a plateau of productivity as, uh, Chad, uh, as Chad so aptly described with the hype curve. Actually in 2006, I actually anticipated that LHC wouldn't work and wrote an article about it. But like Cassandra in the Greek uh, legends and mythology, no one believed in me. Uh, I said that if we're gonna discover it, we're probably gonna have to use indirect means in this article. And now it's gonna involve precision and precision gets back to nanoscience because you are the folks who will be giving us the tools to achieve these higher levels of precision. Now I gotta take you some math lessons. So this is what the Higgs boson looks like when it moves. Well, not quite. The mathematics of a slinky in motion is what we're seeing here is exactly the same mathematics as the Higgs boson. So that's what I mean by the, this is what the Higgs boson looks like. It has one degree of freedom. There are other things uh, that come out of Einstein's revolution and Maxwell's equations. And in particular, looking at equations like this, you can figure out that light has polarization. 
It has two degrees of freedom. Let's set some cartoons in motion so we can pull those two degrees out. You can see a right winding mode and a left winding mode. So those are two helicity states. So those are the two helicity states of the photon. It's what we call a J equal one particle, whereas the Higgs boson was J equals zero. It turns out that in, in history, uh, once you know about polarization, you can figure out perhaps how the Vikings were able to navigate on cloudy days, because it turns out that, uh, that if you look at ice, if you look at a, a quartz crystal from Iceland, you can actually see the polarization. And by using that, you can know where the sun is actually loaded, located, no matter how much clouds. And so we think that, in fact, this was the secret to how uh, the Norsemen were able to navigate on extraordinarily cloudy days. Uh, it's got some math associated with it. So here, take a brief nod. Einstein's field equations have more math. Again, taking a brief nod. This is what a gravity wave looks like to someone who does math. But you folks probably are not interested in that, so let me show you what it looks like. Uh, here, a graviton has two degrees of freedom. We're going to set this cartoon in motion. This is a very nice uh, animation that you can find at YouTube and shows what happens when a gravity wave encounters a circle ring, a set of spherical rings that are set back into the screen. You can see the gravity wave causes the to deform. This will be a linearly polarized gravity wave. That's what we're able to measure essentially at LIGO. But if we had a more sensitive device, we might get to graviton polarization. And as you can see, it causes the rings not only to deform, but the deformation rotates as it comes towards you. So this is a right moving wave. A left moving wave, but you're just the opposite. Again, the deformation, but it's twisting in the left-handed sense. Now, we haven't found gravitons yet, but we're probably gonna find them because that's what tells us that gravity will carry energy in packets, just like electromagnetism. Uh, physicists are starting to worry about that. In 2013, there was this nice article in Nature about how looking at the cosmic microwave background, we might be able to see this twi these kind of twisting polarization states of the graviton. Uh, more recently, this year, Frank Wilczek, a Nobel laureate, and uh, some of his collaborators have talked about if you build a device like LIGO, there's sort of like a noise associated with it. And this noise is a, is a little bit like the sort of Brownian motion, except it's not molecules, it's in the gravitons themselves. And if we can detect this quote unquote Brownian type motion, it will be a signal of the quantum mechanical nature of gravitons. So what's the problem I'm talking about? Well, you gotta combine quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, in 1995, a, a physicist named Witten, who is perhaps the world's most distinguished theoretical physicist, ordered the things that were called string theory. He, were found, he, sh he proposed that all of them are parts of a larger thing called M theory. And M theory has quantum mechanics built into it from its beginning. It also has gravity built into it. So what's the problem I'm after? Well, these things I'm showing you here are functions. You can think of them like stress strain functions if you're someone who does, uh, who looks at materials uh, and how they react. Um, we have some stress strain functions that are like the Higgs boson, and that's why we have these things in the bosons. We have other stresses that act more like the electron, and so that's why we have them in the fermion column. Uh, but when we look at the degrees of freedom of these things, remember if, quantum, if we do quantum mechanics, what I hadn't told you before is quantum mechanics says that you have to allow all possible degrees of freedom in a system, not just the ones that obey Newton's second law. So in here, what I've done is I've written the degrees of freedom for this system. What I've done for uh, the top, if you look under the table, you'll see there's one line. What I've done there is I've counted the degrees of freedom of these uh, fields, but only if they obey the classical equations of motion. If I include quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, it increases. At the classical level, you can see the sum of the two degrees of freedom of the bosons equal to the degree of freedom of the fermion. But the off-shell degrees of freedom do not count. That means you could describe a classical theory with this M theory, but not its quantum mechanical extension. That's the problem I'm after. It turns out that that J thing that I told you about the rate of spin, in these theories, J also uh, takes account the different kinds of deformations that we saw as waves. Uh, in the animations that I uh, showed you. And, but however, if you're gonna calculate these things, it turns out to be extraordinarily more powerful 
to use a graphical tool called a Young to Blow. At the bottom of this slide, I am showing you Young to Blows that are associated with the field variables and the charts at the top. The uh, graviton, which is this quantity we denote by H, is, corresponds to these two blue boxes set left to right. The A field on the top, which is called a three form, corresponds to these three vertical boxes. So we're, we're gonna be moving towards a technology that takes advantage of these graphical representations. Um, this problem was faced before, not in the context of M theory, but in a much simpler theory called supergravity. In 1973 and 1976, uh, two sets of collaborations found the analogs of M theory. This is before M theory ex existed. And then once again, this problem of balancing uh, uh, boson to fermion degrees of freedom was partially solved, namely if you include Newton's law, but not if you do quantum mechanics. However, in 1977, a, Brighton, a physicist named Brighton Loader figured out, well, gee, if I add more fermions and more burn, uh, uh, bosons, I can get the balance I want. And in 1978, it was found that you could do it by adding even less degrees of freedom, namely just bosons, and you get the balance that allows you to do quantum mechanics. That's the problem I'm after, folks, for M theory. What is it? What, are, what is it that goes to dot, dot, dot? Well, here we go to with the answer. So to get to the answer, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. There was a physicist named Max Delbrook who started out in particle physics, but wound up going into biology. Uh, he used physics constructs to make advances in biology and genetics because even physicists were still back then were worried about the ideas of inheritability. What was the physical mechanism by which uh, inheritable traits were transmitted from one generation to another? And some physicists thought well, there might be a kind of crystal involved. Uh, so people like Max started getting into biology and um, he actually eventually got the Nobel Prize, but the Nobel Prize was in physiology and medicine, not in particle physics, where he started his physics career. One of the things he's famous for is Delbrook scattering, which the box that you can see in the middle of this transparency shows, it means light particles scatter off light particles. What's really remarkable about this is that this is a quantum mechanical behavior. Classically, this could never happen. So you can see that quantum mechanics changes the laws of things that we can measure. And that's why we are so confident in our predictions about the universe being quantum mechanical. Uh, here's a, just a, a crystal uh, phagocyte, which actually is gonna re-enter the game. I just wanna introduce you uh, to it. Uh, here is a... Uh, a representation of its fundamental uh, structure. But Rosalind Franklin was an X-ray crystallographer who disabused us of this notion. Uh, she is the person who got the most accurate um, X-ray uh, X-ray uh, scattering diagrams that indicated that the structure of DNA was the double helix. This, of course leads us to this very famous picture where we have base pairs and a backbone that's a sugar phosphate, um, that are sugar phosphate molecules. And that this is in fact, the, the author of the, gene, of the story of life on our planet. And of course the double helix is one of the heroic triumphs of science. Uh, Watson and Crick uh, actually got a Nobel prize for it. But we've been evolving since then. There, have been there are lots of heroes of the story. This is one book that I recommend if you really want to hear more about the story. Uh, we've talked about the human genome more recently, where we now kind of read our own book that tells the universe how it makes us. And bioinformatics has powerfully entered into evolutionary biology. I have a friend named Rick Linsky who's really uh, used this technology in an incredible way. One of the things about evolution is that the time scales are so long that ordinarily you would think you can't actually, uh, you can't actually check whether your theories work. Well, Rick, Richard has actually shown that you can actually redo evolution by using not humans, but instead E. coli. And in fact, for E. coli, what you see here is a chart, a fitness chart. And these black lines that you see are the paths of evolutions where because uh, E. coli uh, degenerates so very rapidly, you can do experiments over 20,000 generations and watch the mutations. And what this graph shows is the mutations that lead to the efficient metabolization of uh, glucose 
But you see, there's one line, there's one mutant line that went over to truth and citrate. So yes, evolution almost always ends up in the same place. But in fact, these sorts of experiments convince us that there are possibilities that are very different. Using uh, the information in uh, these kinds of structures, you, uh, there's a technology called basic local alignment search tools where you can take a snippet of DNA or a snippet of a nucleotide or a protein and ask what's the larger structure from which this is a part of. And in fact, I don't know if any of uh, you folks being in nanoscience actually crossed the line into genetics, but you might actually recognize this website if you do. So Max exported physics into biology. Let's import some biology into physics because remember the problem I'm trying to solve is a purely mathematical problem about trying to make quantum mechanics consistent with, uh, with relativity through M theory. Uh, earlier uh, in, 2000, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, I started really closing in on this part of this problem. This problem, by the way, has been around for over 25 years. No one had found the solution. But with my students, Yang Gray Hu and uh, Hazel Mock, we started having some ideas about how one could solve this problem. But the problem, the solution that we got to looks like genetics. So we developed a series of papers that we have posted to the archives and published. And we combined that with uh, some technology I developed a long time ago in 2004 with a physicist named Michael Fox. Remember I talked about the, the work of, Rosalind, uh, of, of uh, Rosalind Franklin and imaging DNA. Well, in 2004, Michael and I had some kind of idea that the mathematical analog of that imaging was probably possible with the equations that, that govern in theory. And so we started the, uh, developing a graphical technology. The idea is that M theory is sort of the vertex of this pyramid that you see. Our technology uh, shine, we believe, would allow us to look at M theory and then deep within it and find other sub mathematical structures that would give us the information that we were after. Um, the structures that we invented, we call the Dinkras. This made the cover of uh, uh, an issue of Physics World in 2010. The word Adinkra comes from Africa, uh, from West Africa, and it's a word that means symbols with hidden meaning, and that's what we were looking for. We use Einstein's ideas about the way the universe is constructed to do that shining ray that I described for you, and now I'm gonna show you folks. So we start with equations like this, and we wanna shine this mathematical technology in it to sequence these equations. Uh, so this is what the sequence looks like for that top set of equations. Let me go back to the top set. This is what happens when we get our sequencing done. And once you have the sequencing done, you can manipulate the mathematics much more easily. And so here I'm showing you uh, a process that we call uh, getting a valise. The, so we've gone from the top diagram to the bottom and we've sequenced a set of equations. We're now gonna take a, the bottom set of equations here. I'm sorry, the top set of equations, this transpire and sequence them. So this is what we get at the first stage. We can manipulate them. And so we go from top to bottom. And it's these bottom eyes, these things that only have two levels that are the easiest to assign a set of eigenvalues, which I'm showing you here, and the actual sequencing. Now remember, what we've done here is we started with different equations, like Newton's law, like Maxwell's equations, like Einstein's field equations. And we developed this mathematical technology that lets us look inside of it and pull out deeper pieces of mathematics that we have always believed play the roles of genes. And in fact, we can fit these things into very nice mathematical structures. This is something called a permutahedron. And so we've used graph theory, Dinkin labels, and plethism, ple which is a mathematical process for multiplying those boxes that I told you about. And we wrote some really interesting code. And you need modern computers to do this. And we were able to find the answer to our question. How many more degrees of freedom do you have to add to get from an M theory that works only classically to an M theory that's consistent with quantum mechanics? The answer is 2,147,483,648 more bosons and 2,147,483,648 fermions because we built a structure that is the mathematical equivalent of a genome, of a complete genome. And here I'm showing it to you. Uh, it, it comes in levels. It is a 
more or less uh, pyramidal uh, diamond shaped structure. That's why I've got the diamond on the side here, just to emphasize that as we move up from top to bottom, this thing grows out, out and out. It has a maximum length at, le at level 16. And however, this is a count of the fields. And we, uh, we are not only able to tell you how many fields there are, so we can complete the list. We can also tell you about their jiggles, that J parameter that I told you about. We can tell you what the spins are. So as ways, we now know the manifestation of these things. Uh, if one were to ask uh, questions that are similar to what is the polarization like? Here's that level 16. Where do I see the, the things that uh, we uh, that were known before us where there's a 65 plus one is a 66 that's the graviton that 165 here is that three form the thing with three vertical boxes at the next level higher we can see the gravitino and so why am i doing all this why am i worried about this it seems like it's man well i tell people i'm a fallen mathematician i'm really a physicist and i worry about physics several years ago it was also noted that the CMB might allow us to test string theory in a different way. Namely, string theory has these things called higher mass, higher spin states. They should leave signatures or possibly leave signatures on the CMB. Uh, about a, a year ago, I, working with a, a different group of collaborators, actually took this idea seriously and asked what kind of non-Gaussianity would be detectable if string theory left a signal on the CMB. And to our very great surprise, it turns out that the signals look like the electron orbitals that you learn in quantum mechanics. Now this would of course be utterly fantastic. We're not the inventors of that idea, that comes from a group of physicists at Princeton, but for super strings is a very special signature and we identified that. And so the take home is that worrying about mathematics and bringing some Biology it lets you answer questions that you might not be able to answer otherwise. I have some acknowledgments to make. I need to acknowledge a group of scientific collaborators who have been supporting this research by the National Science Foundation and Brown University. Uh, and I also, from a number of the animations come from a course that I did uh, for the teaching company uh, called Super String Theory, the DNA of Reality. Uh, the animations were mostly created by Mr. Ken Griggs and these, most of the CGI medium in this presentation has used these. So I am now at the end of my talk, Chad. Okay, great. Um, thanks uh, a lot, Jim, that was fantastic. Uh, we will now take questions from the audience. Um, for those of you with video and audio access who would like to ask a question, please activate your video and unmute your audio to make us aware that you have a question. Otherwise, please keep your video and audio disabled. Uh, for those of you without video and audio access, please type your question in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your screen. Um, the first question goes to Robert Baseri from Hitachi High Tech, who will appear on the camera to ask his question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for that talk. Uh, really appreciate it. It really took me back from my old, way old physics days. So. <laughs> Um, watching uh, the, about the Higgs boson, I kind of followed the, um, the discovery of that and how there was two different uh, predictions of, of the mass. How did the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, in your opinion, affect the industry? And how did the discovery of that, uh, that specific energy affect you uh, and your research personally? Okay, so first of all, uh, the detection of the Higgs boson was basically a 40 year long exercise. It was mathematically predicted when I was in graduate school. And it wasn't discovered until 2012. And that gives you the kind of time scales that discovery works on. How has it affected us? Well, A, it has given us confidence in what we call the standard model. This thing that gives us these predictions of better than one part in a billion, uh, one of its predictions with the Higgs boson. So we're confident, we have another data point that tells us that we're on the right track. That's one thing that's always important for science. Um, it has also possibly opened some new doors for further discovery. You'll remember that I showed this chart of the, that was very unbalanced when you look left and right, because that's what we know observationally. But I said, mathematically, we could have a more balanced chart with this property called supersymmetry. Well, the Higgs boson is one of the ways that we might see some of those extra particles. So that's gonna be a great challenge for the next uh, generation of experimentalists and the current one, but the next generation of experiments also. 
All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Let me ask one while we're waiting for a second, because uh, I was curious, you know, just listening to this, it, it you know, uh, it reminded me of, of uh, what I think is, is true about science. And that is that big discoveries come from um, being able to uh, cross fields. Um, and you mentioned Max Delbrook, but there are many examples like Rosalind Yalo, invented Eliza, which are so important today. Uh, lots of examples of, of physics or physicists crossing to biology, uh, chemists crossing to biology and, and making big discoveries, sometimes lead to Nobel Prizes. Um, are there any other examples that have done what you've done, which is to go the other way? <laughs> Not in my part of physics, Chad. I mean, this is a sort of my own personal innovation. Uh, it got started in 205, so prior to when I met you when we first had this idea that something like sequencing equations could be done, that, you know, uh, in, order, in, in other words, instead of keeping all the derivatives and all these things that we normally do when we write, for example, Maxwell's equations or Newton's law, that uh, if, if there's enough symmetry, there must be a substructure of mathematics that plays the role of genes, and then you can use that to give you information back up where it's much more difficult. I, in my part of physics, this is a unique observation. And I agree with you, by the way, about the boundary crossing nation of uh, the boundary crossing potentiality that uh, innovation relies on. Is that yeah? No, if you, if you say it's almost always the case. It's almost it's always the case. The, par partly because uh, you, you you buck conventional wisdom and and try things that uh, uh, people have convinced you not to try. Well, uh, Alan Turing, uh, the computer scientist, had this wonderful statement. He said, "It is often the people." that no one, ex no one can imagine anything of who do what no one can imagine. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, next question. Good. Oh. Hi, uh, yeah. I'm George Schatz. Uh, and uh, yeah, you mentioned nano to the fourth early in your talk. I'm not sure I go totally figured out, you know, where that shows up and what you're talking about. Uh, and, uh, you know, but in the end, ultimately, it gets us to think about things that are a lot smaller than, than you know, whatever, atoms or even some of the particles that you were talking about. So, so yeah, we're, tell me about Nano to the Fourth. Sure, happy to do so. So it turns out that um, if you, if you, well, let me tell you, I have a movie, but I'm not going to be a fine because I didn't know what your question would be. But let's go to do a scale of size sort of uh, discussion. If we start out with say uh, blood cells, we're at about uh, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus six. If we go down to atoms, we're at 10 to the minus 10. If we go down to the nucleus, we're at 10 to the minus 15. And so nano is between, uh, uh, is around almost the scale of atoms. Um, but you can ask uh, what else is there in nature? Does, does in other words, is there a smallest size that's, that's relevant to nature? And the way that we, uh, people in my community have answered this question is to ask the question about where do the laws of quantum mechanics seem to break down? As I told you, uh, we know that Einstein's description of gravity is actually inconsistent with the laws of quantum mechanics because of the work of Stephen Hawking principally and, and, and Jacob Bekenstein. And so, you look for a piece of mathematics that doesn't break down like that. And it turns out string theory, as much as it is criticized, doesn't break down in that way. And string theory has a parameter that measures its size. It's called the string tension. And so by looking at this mathematical quantity, comparing it to the way gravity works in our universe, it sets the scale at 10 to the minus 35 for the string parameter. And that's why I said nano to the fourth means you're down at string theory. If you're asking about experimental confirmation, long, long time before we'll directly see strings. There are lots of probably indirect indications that we can probably get to long before we have that kind of technology. Okay, Thanks, we, have, we have a question from the uh, attendees. It says, sorry if I missed this 
but would the detection of helical polarization in a gravitational wave confirm the existence of gravitons? No, and that's a great question. I, 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 the person's not showing their face there. I don't know if they have a, a, a video feed. Well, they're, they're coming, from, coming from the audience, so we, I think they're disabled. Oh, I see, okay. The answer is no. Polarization is not a detection of the quantum nature of gravity. Let me try to put that in context. Um, I don't have on my shades, but I often wear shades, uh, uh, dark glasses. And dark glasses cut down uh, glare because they take uh, into account that glare is mostly a polarized form of light waves. And if you can block them, then you can cut down the glare. Now, having a pair of dark glasses certainly lets you distinguish between polarized and unpolarized light because you can actually take your glasses. In fact, this is an experiment you can often do with computer screens is take a dark set of glasses and simply rotate them through 90 degrees and the apparent brightness of the computer screen will change. And that's because at one angle, you're blocking out some of the polarized light. Now, if you do that, that does not let you measure the fact that the light particles carry energy in bundles. In order to do that, you have to do an experiment where you take x-rays, shine it on metal, that will kick out electrons and you can measure the energy of the electrons. This is the photoelectric effect which is one of the things that Einstein wrote a paper about in, 2000, in 1905. And we need the analog of that experiment in order to measure the graviton that is so famous, for example, in the Star Trek science fiction world. Okay, we've got another question from the attendees. Why is M theory done in 11 dimensions? Actually, what's the point of working in such high dimensions? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, well, first of all, let, let me start with 10 dimensions. So it's kind of simpler to explain it there. That's where in, uh, uh, string theory resides. Why does string theory reside in 10 dimensions? Well, because if you remember, string theory automatically takes quantum mechanics into account. And so you have to ask, uh, if I change dimensions, do I lose that consistency? The answer is for string theory, yes. You lose it at, if you go below 10 dimensions, at least the most naive strings, you lose that quantum consistency. Now, there's some more Baroque things that more, are more intricate to talk about, but at this highest level, that's why string theory is in 10 dimensions. So why 11? Until Witten made his proposal in 1995, 11-dimensional supergravity was seen to be as this oddity that just sits out mathematically, totally unconnected to this, to this, uh, this conceptual foundation of string theory. It has now been proven in many, many different ways that M theory, to the degree that we understand it, is in fact part of this family of theories, these five things that I show on, uh, showed on uh, one of my uh, transparencies, one of my slides. And so it's the mathematical consistency together with the assumption of simplest realization of ideas that forces us to these high dimensions. Uh, by the way, we have to get back down if we're going to do science, obviously, because our world doesn't look like it has more than four dimensions. Uh, uh, Jim, Nathan Janeski here. I had a question actually following on uh, something that came up earlier about, and, and you actually mentioned the potential role of nanoscience and in, in maybe the experimental side. Um, and you, you said many, many years from now, but I wonder if you have a vision to that, sort of speaking more broadly. Well, Many, many. It, well, it depends on which part of my talk that you're talk, that you to, uh, to which you're, you're referring. It, insofar as nanoscience and nanotechnology uh, will allow us to measure at the scales we need to in, in physics, then it will. As soon as that happens, and I don't know, since I'm a look, as I tell people, I I, um, I break things in the laboratory. That's why I'm not an experimentalist. I can break equipment <laughs> faster than the speed of light. Right, right. Uh, so I'm not the one to know in detail uh, rates of uh, innovation in technology, but as soon as those, uh, those scales are measurable, perhaps through nanotechnology, that will open up a new set of tools for physicists to go and make the measurements. And it may not be decades and decades. It, you folks will determine that clock. Right, thank you. Some hope for our students online, I think. Well, maybe some students will do it. <laughs> Here's, here's a general physics question. In, in, in the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. Protons have positive charge, so these protons inside the nucleus repel each other. If yes, then why doesn't the nucleus collapse? 
If no, then why? Because they're the same charges that should repel each other. Okay, because in the nucleus, there's another force. This is something that um, I didn't talk about. In Nate, uh, let's see, can I, uh, am I still able to share my slide deck? I think so. Okay, so let me try to do that. Okay, so are we seeing a list of elementary particles? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm, I didn't get the name of the person who asked the question, but you see in nature, there are three fundamental forces. There's a force of electromagnetism. The carrier is the photon. I'm pointing it to it on my slide deck. I hope you can see my cursor moving back and forth. Yep, we can. There's also the weak nuclear force. It has three carriers. They are the W minus, the W plus, and the WZ. Uh, and the uh, neutral Z0 boson. The strong nuclear force actually has eight carriers. They're called gluons, and I'm circling those on the slide deck right now. So when you look at the nucleus, what happens is the photons are telling the two charged protons they need to move apart, but the gluons are telling them to stay together. And that's why we call this the strong nuclear force, because it is stronger than the electromagnetic repulsion. Okay, great. Any more questions? Okay, so uh, if not, uh, that will bring uh, the, the, the session to a close. Please join me in, in thanking Professor Gates virtually again. Thanks, Jim. That was fantastic. Well, thank you. I, I hope it lived up your <laughs> lived up to what you want to see, Chad. Oh no, that's we're getting rave reviews. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there are any, uh, if there are anyone, if there's anyone who wishes to send me a question, I'm open to doing that. If they will work through uh, your registration, folks, or ultimately, it's easier to find me online. You just put in Jim Gates Physics into a Google search, you'll find me.